about John's letter today, if we could stand as we finish up uh, what John tells us here. He's landing the plane, okay? We're going to land the plane today. This is the last message of... 1 John. Chapter 5, verses 14 through 21. He starts off here, Now this is the confidence that we have in Him, that if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. If we know that He hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we have asked of Him. If anyone sees his brother sinning a sin which does not lead to death, he will ask, and he will give him life for those who commit sin not leading to death. There is sin leading to death. I do not say that he should pray about that. Verse 17, all unrighteousness is sin, and there is sin not leading to death. Verse 18 and 19, we know that whoever is born of God does not sin, but he who has been born of God keeps himself, and the wicked one does not touch him. We know that we are of God, and the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us an understanding that we may know Him who is true, and we are in Him who is true, in His Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. Amen. That's how John finishes this letter. Let's pray. Lord, I thank You. I thank you for this amazing letter that we've been studying here for months. Father, I pray as we finish this up that uh, you would reassure us who we are in your sight. Father, that we, we do worship the one true God who came to this world in the flesh and as God at the same time. That you are the one true God and that you revealed yourself to us to the apostles and you reveal yourself to us daily through your spirit that lives in us and we're so thankful for that father you've never left us alone from day one you have given us a guide a compass within our heart called the spirit of truth the holy spirit to guide and direct us each and every day help us to remember that and be reassured that we're never alone we ask this in your son jesus name amen, amen. you may have a seat So again, today's message is called Blessed Assurance. Does that ring a bell? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's a great old song, isn't it? Blessed Assurance. Um, maybe you've sang that song a time or two here. It's a wonderful, wonderful old hymn. I don't know if you know the story about the two women that actually co-wrote this song, Blessed Assurance. One of them is a woman by the name of Fanny Crosby. Fanny Crosby was known as the queen of the gospel songwriters. Um, she was born in 1820. She died at the age of 94 in the year 1915. Fanny was a teacher and a mission worker in the slums of New York City. But she was also a poet, and God had gifted her with the gift of composing as well. One thing I didn't tell you about Fanny is she's completely blind. Completely blind. Yet this woman had a way of blessing generation after generation with 8,000 hymns of her vision of a God that she doesn't see. How many of us see God? None of us. She has blessed us with her words that were inspired through her faith. What an inspiration. Again, she co-wrote over 8,000 hymns. One day, a friend of hers by the name of Phoebe Knapp, who uh, lived in a mansion in New York City, actually in Brooklyn. I mean, these two women are totally different. One's working in the slums of New York, and the other one is living in a mansion in Brooklyn. But yet they were good friends because they had the same gift of composing. So Phoebe Knapp had written this song, had just got done doing a composition, and she gets a hold of her friend Fanny to come over and listen to it. And after Fanny had heard this composition that Phoebe had played, she slapped her hands together and she says, that's blessed assurance. She knew immediately, and so she started writing and pinning the words to this wonderful, wonderful hymn. And together, these two women, who are totally opposite of one another, has blessed generation after generation because of their faith in God. 
faith brings us all together, doesn't it? It has a way of looking past who we are socially. It tears down walls. And so, why am I sharing this with you? You're probably wondering. Well, today, as we finish this letter, John's doing something very similar. He's giving his audience in the first century and every generation after that a blessed assurance of who they are. Not only of who they are, but whose they are in this last chapter here. He's provided. He, he, he wants everybody to know before he puts his pen down, before he finishes this letter, that we are the children of God. He wants everyone to know that in the first century. And he wants us to know that today as well. So today we're going to look at three ways that we have this blessed assurance as we finish out this letter. And our first point actually goes to where we finished last week in verse 13. Maybe you remember this, where John finished uh, this section out saying, These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. I mean, he tells us why he's writing it, right? I'm writing this so that you know you have eternal life, who you are. You are a child of God. You have eternal life. I'm writing these so you have an assurance that you have eternal life. Remember, uh, He's, he's writing this to the first century, but he also wants every generation after that to have a rock-solid faith. A rock-solid faith that won't be moved by the false teachers that are out there in the world. We've got to remember who we're listening to, right? We have to know and discern the godly from the ungodly voices. That's what he's trying to get everyone to go and remember to listen to that voice of truth that is inside each and every believer. God has given you that. What a gift you have if we would listen, right? I'm talking to myself, too. You know, we can get caught up in stuff, and we don't listen to that voice of truth that's screaming at us some days. Do the right thing. So we want to listen to that voice of the truth. Because you know what? Sometimes we drop the ball. And what I mean by that is we sin. We're all sinners, and uh, sometimes we drop the ball, even though we are believers. And sometimes there's a voice out there that wants to tell you that, how could that happen if you truly are a believer, right? That old devil, he likes to get into your head when you've dropped the ball and remind you, again, that you are a sinner, like you didn't know that. But he might say, how can you do this if you truly are saved? How can you be still doing this same sin? That's why it's important that we remember and listen to the voice that says differently. The one that says who we are. Like Jesus' voice in chapter 10 of John's Gospel. The same guy, John. Jesus said this, and John just wrote it down. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. That's a different voice, isn't it? As opposed to the one that wants to remind you who you are. He wants to remind you that you're redeemed. Jesus wants to remind you that you're redeemed. The devil wants to remind you that you're a sinner. And Jesus says, I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. Just for a double reassurance, my Father who has given them to me is greater than all. God is greater. And no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. So that's double assurance, right? They can't no one can snatch you out of Jesus' hands, and nobody can snatch you out of the Father's hand. What a blessed assurance we have. Jesus is mine. Oh, blessed assurance. Again, back in the first century, there were many different groups of false teachers out there, just like we face today. Different cults, religions, things like that, trying to warp the minds of the first century believers. These people that just started learning about uh, God and learning about their faith. Many times John refers to them as little children because they're young. They're young in their faith. They don't know yet. And he wants them to make sure that they are discerning the voices of the godly as opposed, as opposed to the voices of the ungodly. Listen to the voices of the godly. Be reassured that you do have eternal life. Going back to verse 13. That you may know. That you may know that you have eternal life. 
Not only that you know it, but that you continue to believe it day in and day out. Because every day brings a different battle, doesn't it? There's a lot of voices uh, out there competing for your attention, wanting to uh, warp your mind, wanting to steal your heart. You want to listen to the voice of the godly, those continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. Let's face it, we have a daily bo uh, battle. Uh, a lot of times it comes through this thing called the TV, right? Uh, almost every house has a TV, right? Does it hear, anybody here not have a TV? God bless you if you don't. I'd like to throw mine out, but I like football. But anyway, <laughs> TV. I think, that, I think those letters sometimes stand for traumatizing venom, you know? TV stands for traumatizing venom. It's poison, I tell you. <laughs> it's poison. Yeah, so we, we have to know as the people of God who we're listening to because there's a lot of voices of the ungodly coming at us in different angles, especially every time we flip that thing on. We're going to hear something that we don't agree with. It's totally against the Word of God. Our commercials, like, for heaven's sakes, our commercials have gotten way carried away. Some of the stuff that we are seeing in our commercials should be X-rated. It's unbelievable how far this has gotten. If you struggle with trying to figure out what's right and what's wrong, go back to what John said in chapter 4, verse 1. Beloved, and this is a term of endearment. Brothers and sisters, beloved, with all my heart, I'm asking you, do not believe every spirit, but test them through the Word of God. Everybody has a Bible. If you don't, we can line you up with one. Test them. Test the spirits through the Word of God. See if they are of Him or not. Again, many false teachers, many false prophets have went out into the world. And we see that today. This brings us to our first point. Blessed Assurance. Talking about that famous song, Blessed Assurance, Jesus is Mine. It's the fact that we have eternal life, right? That you may know that you have eternal life. What a blessed assurance to know that. Continue to believe that each and every day of your life. We have to. We have to have that daily bread. Because the world will feed you just like that if you're not going to your daily bread. The world will be more than happy to feed you with whatever the world's full of, which isn't good, right? But have this blessed assurance that Jesus is yours. And if he is yours, then speak that powerful name over all these ungodly voices that are around you trying to compete for your attention. He is our shepherd. We are his sheep. Like we went back there in the Gospel of John, verse, uh, chapter 10. So out of all the voices that we hear, make sure you're listening to the voice of truth. Be assured that you have eternal life. Moving on to verses 14 and 15, John says, now this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we have asked of him. So we're getting to the end of this letter, and John wants to one more time get into our prayer life here. That's what he's talking about, the prayer life. Uh, our quiet time with the Father. We talk to him and we address him for who he is, how powerful, how wonderful, how loving, how full of grace he is and mercy. So we address him for who he is. And then we are confident that we are his children without a doubt, and so we are. You remember that verse back, uh, back in chapter 3, verse 1? Talk about reassurance, or blessed assurance. See what kind of love the Father has given to us. All we have to do is look to the cross, right? See what kind of love the Father, His one and only Son, He has given to us, so that we can have eternity with Him. See what kind of love the Father has given us, that we should be called the children of God. Everyone who believes in that cross, everything that happened in the cross, on that cross, we will be called the children of God. And I love this. And so we are. Talk about blessed assurance. And so we are. That's one of my favorite verses. Is that not reassuring? We are the children of our Father in heaven. We can be confident when we reach out to Him in prayer. But here's the thing. We want to be on the same page going back uh, to what John was saying in chapter 5. Now this is the confidence that we have in him that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. That's where it all starts, right? 
getting on the same page as he is, being in agreement on what's good for us. Because he knows better, doesn't he? God knows better. We ask for all kinds of things that are very worldly, I would, I would imagine, because my prayer life can go there sometimes. Why would he grant me that if it's going to be hurtful or harmful for me? Um, a gentleman named R.A. Torrey, I don't know if you've ever heard of that gentleman, but uh, he was uh, the head of the Bible Institute in Chicago that would uh, later be named Moody Bible Institute. Uh, good friends with D.L. Moody. And he said this about our prayer life. He said, prayer is the key that unlocks all the storehouses of God's infinite grace and power. All that God is, all that God has, is at disposal of prayer. But we must use the key. We must use the key. Prayer can do anything that God can do, since God can do anything. Prayer is omnipotent. That's the power of prayer. Did you realize how powerful your prayers are? I hope we do. Maybe you remember back, uh, going back late, uh, earlier in this chapter, or this book, letter, when John said this in chapter 3, Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence towards God. Whatever we ask, we receive from Him because we keep His commandments and do those things that are pleasing in His sight. What's he saying here? What's John saying here? He's saying, well, God answers our prayers when we're on the same page, right? We're keeping His commandments. Or another way, or another way of saying it is, is we are doing what pleases Him. So we want to pray according to His will, not our will. And that's where the battle begins, doesn't it? Because these human hearts can be very selfish, right? We all have a human heart. And, and they, become, they can be very, very selfish. It's a matter of our will or God's will. And that's where, it all, that's where it all lies. If we're praying in His will, then He's going to grant it to us. Like He said back there in chapter 5, our petitions will be granted. That means request. Our request that we have asked of Him will be granted. He doesn't want to give us anything that's going to hurt us. What father would do that, right? Our Heavenly Father sure wouldn't do that. Here's the thing. God lives in the future and in the present at the same time. So He already knows what's best for you. He's not going to give you anything that's going to mess you up, right? So sometimes we're, our prayers, when we ask for things or that could be selfish, He's not going to grant those. And I'm thankful for that. <laughs> How about you? Some of the things I pray for in, as a new believer, uh, I, yeah, I'm so thankful he didn't, pray, he didn't grant me those things because I'd be all messed up. I'd be all messed up. Not that I'm not now, you know. <laughs> but that's why I need Him. That's why I need Him, because I am all messed up, you know. But I'm His child. But my heart would be full of stuff from the world because that's what I would have been praying for you know stuff stuff that I don't need stuff that is worldly and that's what John said earlier in this letter do not love the world or the things of the world the desires of the flesh the eyes the pride of life remember things like that that's going to get you in trouble the desires of the flesh going back there to verse uh, 14 and 15 now this is the confidence that we have in him that if we ask anything according to his will he hears us and if we know that he hears us whatever we ask we know that we have the petitions or the requests that we have asked of Him. So what should we be praying for then? Well, John's going to tell us. We should be praying for each other because we're all sinners, right? We're all sinners. John's going to mention the word sin five times in these two verses. If anyone sees his brother sinning a sin, which does, does not lead to death, he will ask and he will give him life for those who commit sin not leading to death. There is sin leading to death. I do not say that he should pray about that. All unrighteousness is sin, and there is sin not leading to death. Wow, that's confusing, isn't it? It's very confusing. Let's look at the first part. 16, like I'll, I, I'll say A, 16A. He mentions someone whose sin does not lead to death. And then the second part of 16, he talks about a sin that does lead to death. I just want to say this before we break this down, that all sin leads to death eventually, right? All sin, I mean, that's, we're in a fallen world. We're all going to die a physical death. That's what sin did when it entered this world. God wanted everyone to live forever, but man screwed that up when they bit that apple. 
I'm going to take, I'm going to blame man just as much as I will blame <laughs> Eve on that, right? The woman that you gave me. Yeah, anyway. <laughs> but that, yeah. So we're all going to die eventually because of that. That's, unless Jesus comes back and takes the church before that, we're all going to face a physical death. But we don't have to face a spiritual death. Hallelujah. But anyway, all sin leads to death. In verse 16a, John is letting us know of our sinful nature, really. Even though we are forgiven, we still sin, right? We talked about that earlier. Sometimes we drop the ball. We do it because we're sinners. We'll never be sinless in this world as we walk this earth. But if we listen to the voice of truth, we can sin less. We'll never be sinless, but we can sin less if we're listening to that voice inside of us. But the amazing thing about all of this is we do not lose our salvation over the deal. Remember that? Jesus said, yeah, nobody will snatch you out of my hand. The Father says, nobody's going to snatch you out of my hand. And God is greater than all, right? That's Jesus' words himself. But you know, sometimes we get caught up in a sin where it seems like it's rinse and repeat. Right? We just can't seem to get out of this cycle. Rinse and repeat. We find ourselves doing the same. We don't willingly do this, but we have a sinful nature. We, we don't even know it until we're doing it. So we didn't really choose to do it, but our sinful nature took us there. Does that make sense? Yeah. And that's why it's so important that we pray for our brothers and sisters who are struggling. Look again at verse 16a. If anyone sees his brother sinning a sin, which does not lead to death, that's what I'm talking about there, he will ask, and he, capital H, the Father, will give him life for those who commit sin not leading to death. Please understand what John is saying here. If we see someone who is sinning, and, and it's one of those sins where they, they're not willingly doing it, but they're a sinner, right? And they're sinning. What we should do, the first thing we should do, is not talk about them behind their back. Gossip about them behind their back. The first thing we do is take it to the Father. That's what John is telling us. Pray for them if we see a brother sinning, or sister. <laughs> she bit the apples, you know, the woman you gave me. Anyway, <laughs> does not lead to death. He will ask, he or she will ask for her brother or sister. And he, the Father in heaven, capital H, will give them life for those who commit sin, not leading to death. So we go to the Father, instead of talking about people behind their back. I mean, if you have a problem with talking about people behind their back, talk to the Father first. Talk to Him. Tell Him all about Him. Ask Him to restore your brother or sister in Christ. Put them back on the right path, the path that leads to righteousness, that He will make their joy complete again in Him. Not in the things of the world. That's what we pray for. We go to Him first. We don't go say, hey, did you see what Joe's doing? We don't do that. That's what John's getting at. If anyone sees a brother sinning, a sin that does not lead to death, he will ask God, and He, God, will give him life for those who commit sin, not leading to death. Okay, I think we got that one. Let's go to the other part here. There is a sin leading to death. I do not say that he should pray about that. It's pretty strong, isn't it? There is a sin leading to death. I do not say that we should pray about that. Okay, so John doesn't specify. <laughs> that would be a lot of help, wouldn't it? If he said, hey, here's the sin. But he doesn't do that. He doesn't give us a specific sin or a list of specific sins that lead to death. But I don't think we have to look too far in the world that we live in to see groups of people that are living in total defiance of God's Word. Would you agree? I mean, I'm not, I don't want to point out any one group because there's so many. But there's so many out there that deliberately sin. They choose to sin. They choose to live in defiance of God's holy scriptures. It's as if they're shaking their fist at God and saying, stay out of my life. Would you agree? I think that's what John's getting at. There is sin leading to death. And I do not say that he should pray about that. You know, I want to take you to a verse that was prophesied almost 850 years before John wrote this letter. Look at that first word there in Isaiah chapter 5. 
Woe. Let's say it all right there. Huh. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own sight. This describes the days that we live in, friends. Again, this was written over 850 years ago before John wrote this letter from the prophet Isaiah. This is prophecy, talking about the future, talking about today. Yeah. Again, the sin isn't specified that John's talking about here. The sin leading to death. John says that we need not pray about that. You know, sometimes people are so caught up in sin that it's going to take an intervention of God to get their attention. We can pray all day long, but until God steps in, they're not going to change. Because they've gotten so broken because of their sin, there's only one place they can look, and that is up. Until God intervenes in that person's life, I don't think whatever you and I say or pray about is going to really, you know, I mean, we want to continue to pray, but John's saying, this is a sin leading to death. This is different. God's going to have to do this, right? God's going to have to step in. Maybe you recall, recall uh, moving on here to verse 17, John says, all righteousness, unrighteousness is sin, and there is sin not leading to death. I know this is confusing. Maybe you recall back in chapter 3, verse 8, where John said this, whoever makes the practice of sinning. That's what I'm getting at. Those who are deliberately living in defiance of God. Those who make a practice of sinning is of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared, why Jesus came into this world, was to destroy the works of the devil. Look at all unrighteousness is sin. That first part there. 17, all unrighteous. That's what he's talking about. Whoever makes a practice of sinning, that would be unrighteous, right? You're, pra you're, you're deliberately doing this. You're deliberately committing a sin. You know it's wrong, and you're doing it anyway. That's what the unrighteousness makes a practice of sinning. Or to put it another way, calling sin good and calling good evil, like Isaiah was saying there. Therefore, they just keep on sinning, you know. Deliberately. And it's true. We still sin today. We're all still sinners. But a born-again believer repents when they sin because they have the voice of truth convicting them and telling them that they're wrong, right? And that's what the last part of verse 17. There is a sin not leading to death. The sin that not, does not lead to death is coming from a sinner who has confessed his sin. It doesn't lead to death. It leads to repentance, right? Because the voice of truth is calling us out. <laughs> Aren't you thankful for that? I'm thankful for that voice of truth. We're listening to the voice of truth, and the voice of truth is saying, hey, you're going down the wrong road, brother or sister. I'm sure you've had that many times. We're all sinners. I know I have. I probably will before the week's over, maybe even before the day's over. I'm so thankful for the voice of truth telling me to turn around and come home. Come back to the Father's house. You're heading the wrong direction. And then that leads to repentance, doesn't it? That's a sin not leading to death. That's what believers do. They repent because of the conviction of the voice of truth living inside of us. Again, that's blessed assurance, isn't it? <laughs> we have the voice of truth. That takes us to our second point here. Perfect submission. Perfect delight. The assurance of answered prayer. So we, if what I just talked about there, we should pray according to God's will, not our will, but His, and then we want to pray for sinning believers. We're all sinning believers, right? We want to pray for each other, not talk about them behind their back, but take it to the Father. But I go back to that song, Blessed Assurance, verse 2. It starts off, perfect submission, perfect delight. Submitting to the voice of truth is what I'm getting at. Submission. Now, we don't like that word, <laughs> do we? We come across that word submission in the Bible. Our defensive walls just kind of, I don't want to hear that. I don't like that. I don't like submitting to anybody or anything. But perfect submission tells the world who we belong to, doesn't it? When we 
respond to the voice of truth. It shows the world around us who we're really listening to. We're not listening to the voices of the ungodly. We're listening to the voice of the godly. Let's move on to verse 18 and 19. <clears throat> John says, we know that whoever is born of God does not sin, but he who has been born of God keeps himself, and the wicked one does not touch him. We know that we are of God, and the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. So we're getting really close to the end of this letter. And John's going to leave us with three we know statements, <clears throat> starting here in verse 18. We know that anyone born of God does not continue to sin. The one who's been born of God keeps himself. So that means he guards himself. We have the voice of truth helping us, right? Guards himself. And the wicked one does not touch him because he's listening to the godly voice that's inside of him and not the ungodly voice in the world. That way he doesn't get harm. That's what the first one is. We know that whoever's born of God does not sin, but he who's been born of God keeps himself and the wicked one does not touch him. The next one is in verse 19, where John says, we know that we are of God, and the whole world lies under the sway or control of the wicked one. <clears throat> and then our third we know statement is in verse 20. And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us an understanding that we may know him who is true. And we are in him who is true, in his son Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. So once again, John's coming back to the deity of Jesus Christ. He's talking about the true God who is man and God at the same time. He came in the flesh. If you remember how he started this letter out, that which was from the beginning. What an interesting way to start a letter. That which was from the beginning, which our eyes, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled concerning the word of life. The life was manifested. It was shown to us. It's been revealed to us. That's what that word manifested means. The life was manifested. And we have seen. We bear witness. John walked with him. Right? He walked with Jesus, our Savior. And I declare to you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us through the Son. Again, John says, we know, we know that the Son of God come and has given us an understanding that we may know Him. We may know that which was from the beginning. That's what he's getting at. That. And we know that the Son of God has come and this is the true God. This is the true God. Pretty amazing how he ends this letter similarly to the way he started it. We know that which was from the beginning. You look at John's gospel. He's talking about the Word who became flesh. <clears throat> in the beginning was the Word, right? That's what John's talking about in his letter here, that. Then John does something very interesting as he enters... Uh, finishes up this letter. This is the last verse of this letter. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. Amen. <laughs> kind of interesting, isn't it? Oh, by the way, little children, keep yourselves from idols. Amen. Again, little children means new believers. New believers. It's like John is saying, for the last time before I put my pen down, stay away from those things that separate you from the one true God. Right? That who was from the beginning. This God that we saw with our own eyes. We talked with, broke bread with him. We walked with him. We saw him crucified. We saw the empty tomb. We saw him resurrected. That God is the true God. All these other gods are dead. Keep yourself from idols, the things of this world. Leads us to our final point. <clears throat> Excuse me. Blessed assurance. We have this assurance that we have fellowship with God through His Son. We are free from sin. We are free from Satan's grip. And we know the true God, Jesus Christ. What blessed assurance that we have. We have fellowship with God. We have a relationship with God. Day in and day out. From the time you wake up to the time you go to sleep. And all the time you are asleep, you still have this relationship with God. What a gift. I think about these parting words from John. Staying away from idols. 
little children. I think about the grip that they have on us and how they've got a grip on so many people who have been listening to the voices of the ungodly. Drowning people. Blinding people. Fooling people to thinking that this is what they're looking for. These idols. God says it differently, doesn't he? These idols cannot offer them eternal life. They will rust. They will decay. They will rot away the things of this world. Only Christ will live forever. And we too can live forever. So let's put our idols aside and hold on to the promises of God. This is what John's telling us. And that should give us all a blessed assurance this morning. We thank. I pray that you've been blessed with this letter because we are now at the end of this letter. And it's given you very many helpful tips to go back to and remember who you are, test the spirits, all these great things. He who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. So many things in this letter that's reassured us of who we are and whose we are. <clears throat> you know, that song, Blessed Assurance, claims uh, in, the, in the chorus that this is my story. This is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. I pray, brothers and sisters, that you have that blessed assurance this morning. The one true God is the God that you bow down to. I pray that you have that blessed assurance this morning. It's only fitting that we finish today off singing that wonderful song. But let's pray first. Father, again, I thank you for how you blessed us through this letter of John's how it's so relevant to the times that we live in. <clears throat> There's so many groups out there that are blinded. And uh, Father, we, we have our own problems. We know that. We're sinners. But I pray for those who are, have been blinded and are continuing to live it, living a lifestyle that uh, they practice in sinning. Father, I pray that you would convict their hearts. And that you would help us to shine our light through tenderness and, and grace. Because we were all there at one time. We've all been blinded before. But I thank you for your wonderful light. That now we see the truth. And we have your word. We can test the spirits with the things that are in this world. To keep us walking on that path that leads to righteousness. That leads to you. I know that that's what you're calling us to do. To be imitators of your son. Help us to do that. Help us to do that with courageous, uh, with, with a courageousness and boldness that could only come from you. And Father, help us to point this world to you and do so with tenderness and love. You're the only answer for this world. Help us to do that, Father. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.